The search for planets orbiting distant stars, known as exoplanets, is one of the fastest growing fields in astronomy. From scorching hot Jupiter-like worlds to planets similar to, yet 10 times bigger than Earth, exoplanet science has revealed just how diverse our galaxy is. The Wide Field Infrared Survey Telescope, or WFIRST, is one of the newest telescopes joining in the search. I spoke to astronomer Savannah Jacklin to find out about her involvement in the mission, how WFIRST will operate, and what it might discover. My name is Dr. Savannah Jacklin, and I am currently working at Vanderbilt University in Nashville, Tennessee, in the United States. And my focus for the past five years or so has been on a type of science called gravitational microlensing, which is a very unique and largely understudied way to find new planets outside of our solar system. Yes. Now, the concept of microlensing itself is is, is actually quite difficult to get your head around. And it, it's the kind of thing that when you first read about it, you think, can that actually be real? I was wondering, could you could you explain to us a little bit about microlensing and perhaps about about its background, like kind of who discovered it and and why, why we use it? So microlensing is a fairly new concept in terms of scientific discoveries in astronomy. It was first proposed actually by Einstein in the 1930s, but he thought and he wrote that he, while this is physically possible, we would never ever be able to observe it because there is less than a one in a million chance per star per year of seeing a microlensing phenomenon. However, with advances in technology like the CCD, for example, uh, we're able to monitor many millions of stars at once. And what had once been impossible has now become a pretty regular occurrence, finding these microlensing events. So for microlensing to actually occur, you need three parties. You need the observer, which is usually here on Earth, um, or perhaps a satellite orbiting Earth. You have a background star at the very center of our galaxy. And then in between the background star and the observer is what we call the lens system. And the lens system is a star that sometimes has a planet around it that passes between the background star and the observer on Earth and allows, uh, and as it passes in between, it acts like a giant magnifying glass in space. It magnifies the light from the background star as it's viewed by the observer on Earth. So when that happens, uh, the background star appears to get up to 1,000 times brighter than it's supposed to be. And different variations in that bright brightness, bumps and wiggles, can indicate if there is a planet also orbiting that lens star. I had read about um, gravitational lensing before, and I'd, I'd kind of read it as like um, light from a from a galaxy cluster being being magnified by light from a galaxy. I wasn't actually aware that um, it could happen on such a small scale and still be observable. Mm -hmm. So it, it is actually pretty much the, the same concept. Uh, you have the gravitational lensing on the sort of the macro scale when we're talking about the galaxies. But microlensing does uh, exist. It's just, uh, as of right now, we're really only able to see it within our own galaxy. Uh, and you need to have very sensitive instruments that uh, are unwavering in their observations of stars. So they have to look all the time or almost all the time. And they need to look, take many pictures, uh, have a high cadence uh, over time in order to find these events. So that's something uh, that's different from sort of the macro lensing, which is very, very long scale. Micro lensing is on a much shorter time scale, uh, anywhere from one hour to maybe 45 days or so for a planetary event to be occurring. Okay. Um, but that brings us nicely on to the uh, WFIRST instrument. Um, I mean, you're kind of working on it from the perspective of the UK Infrared Telescope, but I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about the WFIRST instrument and, and, and kind of what it's, what it's going to do. Mm -hmm. So WFIRST is a really incredible space mission uh, that was uh, coming out of uh, primarily NASA. And it's supposed to be launched in the mid-2020s. And it's kind of like a successor to Hubble and the James Webb Space Telescope, uh, except it's looking specifically in the infrared. And what WFIRST is going to do specifically for microlensing is the 
that it's the first ever space-based microlensing mission, like dedicated space-based microlensing mission that has ever been uh, successful or has ever been said, okay, we're going to now build this instrument and then launch it. So one of the things with, uh, with infrared light is that it's really hard to do infrared astronomy from the ground. And we look in the infrared for microlensing because we're looking at the center of our galaxy and the center of our galaxy is obscured by a lot of dust. Infrared has a very special, infrared light has a very special and unique property such that it's actually able to see through that dust and see much further um, than the regular visible light that our eyes see. And when we launch something into space, we don't have to deal with the infrared light that, uh, from our atmosphere that often obscures our observations, just like the dust does at the center of the galaxy. And it allows us to see a lot further and a lot better uh, doing this from space. But until now, there has been no dedicated space-based microlensing mission. And WFIRST will be uh, pointing its uh, telescope lens at uh, the specific area of the sky that we need for microlensing in a dedicated way for a large portion of its mission. And we're very excited about that. <laughs> um, would you be able to, to describe to us just exactly what what will happen in, in terms of, say, like a planet passing in front of its star and what, what WFIRST will actually see and, and how that data will kind of be interpreted by astronomers back on Earth? Mm -hmm, sure. So basically what we're looking for is something called a light curve for the star. So a light curve is just looking at the magnitude or brightness of light over time. And when you have a microlensing event that's just a star, no planet, you get sort of a, an upside down bell shape. If you've ever seen a, a Gaussian curve or something like that, you get a, a sort of a bell shaped light curve and it's called a Pachinsky curve. When you have a planet that is also associated with that lens star, the shape of that Pachinsky curve is altered. Sometimes it gets uh, big spikes that are associated with it. Sometimes it looks a little bit like an eye of Sauron. Uh, and sometimes it just looks really crazy altogether. But if you have, if you know there's a microlensing event, you have this you expect to see this very characteristic shape of light curve, and you see any deviations from that light curve, that any deviations from that specific shape, you know that you want to investigate it further. And by uh, applying various techniques uh, fitting this light curve uh, using pretty advanced software that's being developed now, we're able to figure out some of the characteristics of a planet that might be indicated by those bumps and wiggles. That's incredible. But um, I suppose one of, the, one of the questions that kind of arises from that is that we already have um, methods of detecting and analyzing exoplanets like like the transit method, for example, where we're just looking for a dip in, in the star's light. Why do we need to use something like microlensing? I've read that it's 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 less common and harder to, to detect. So what are the reasons for, uh, for employing this, this method? So the reason for uh, microlensing is that it explores a really different area of parameter space. So it finds different types of planets than transits or radio velocity methods, which are most popular today, uh, are able to find. So microlensing is sensitive to planets that are just beyond the snow line. So this is about the area where Mars is in our solar system. And it's also very good at finding low mass planets. So one of the things that we learned from, say, transit surveys, for example, is that there are a decent amount of what we call hot Jupiters out there. So really big planets that are orbiting very, very close to their host star. Sometimes their, day, their uh, years are like four days long. Microlensing can find actual analogs to our solar system. So it can find small planets that are far from their stars, like Earth or Mars, um, and, and even further beyond more exotic planets, the types of things that we don't see in our solar system. So a lot of what we do with microlensing is trying to understand the sort of zoo of planets that exists within our galaxy, and microlensing is able to look in that specific area where uh, others can't. And we're trying to see if there are really other Earths out there, or other Marses, and hopefully eventually move on to characterize them. Mm. So do you think that this has implications then for, for the search for, for life beyond our solar system, for example? 
I think it does to a decent degree. So a lot of times what we're looking for, uh, we look for life as we know it, right? So that means usually the biggest indicator is does liquid water or can liquid water exist on surface? And we know that for that to occur, it needs to be sort of on at somewhere around the snow line, preferably inwards of the snow line, such that uh, you can have that liquid water. And because microlensing is sensitive to that, I think what we'll find with w first when w first finds many, many new planets, we'll be able to say, okay, here's the probability of having an, a quote, Earth-like planet. And we'll have a much better handle on that with microlensing than we've been able to produce thus far. So if we can figure out how many planets can host life, then maybe we can reevaluate what uh, our expectations are maybe for our galaxy, for example. I think it's definitely worth um, talking about the um, UK Infrared Telescope in this uh, context, because as far as I understand it, it's, it's kind of acting as, as almost like a pathfinder. Is that, is that correct? Yes, uh, that is pretty much what we call our survey. Uh, so we've been using uh, UKIRT for about five years now, from 2015 uh, on onwards. And what we've been doing is sort of a precursor survey for WFIRST. So in the past, most microlensing observations have been in optical wavelengths, the stuff we see with our eyes. And that's great, and we've discovered a lot, but in order to find the most number of microlensing events for the fewest number of observations, you need to look at really, really crowded areas of sky. So this is areas where three objects, the source, the lens, and the observer are most likely to line up. And the most crowded area of our sky is the galactic center. If you have the dust there, you can't see through it if you're using those optical wavelengths. So UKIRT is the first... Uh, infrared survey, infrared ground-based microlensing survey that has actually looked and tried to map out the probability of microlensing events at our galactic center. And the reason we're doing that is because we want to maximize what W first will see. So we're trying to help inform the field locations. So where will point W first uh, to maximize its science um, such that we can find the most number of planets with w first's limited time. That's incredible. I mean, how did you kind of come to to work with with you, Kurt? Was this and and was was microlensing something that you always wanted to get into? So microlensing is actually something I didn't learn about until I uh, entered grad school. And uh, it, because it's a bit of an unusual technique of finding exoplanets, uh, it takes it, it's, it's a fairly small field. There's only a couple hundred of us in, in the world. But um, as a graduate student, I found a group of people who had already started this project in around 2016. And um, they were looking for a student to help them with the analysis. And that's how I ended up getting involved. And I, I sort of never stopped. I've always been interested in planets. Uh, I've always been interested in sort of discovering new worlds. And I used to work with uh, trying to find transiting planets with other ground-based telescopes. But microlensing provided a very unique opportunity to work with new people on a kind of a, a baby science. Like it's, it's a brand new type of science. And that seemed very exciting to me. So I'm, I'm looking forward to learning more about these, these new worlds that we're discovering. Wouldn't you say the same about um, exoplanet science in general? I mean, it's incredible when you think that, that, that the first kind of confirmed detection was in the early 90s, and, and now it's just, it's just completely exploded. Yes, it's uh, completely, completely changed. And one of the things that's most exciting to me is that the landscape is still extraordinarily dynamic, even though we've gone through uh, a lot of new discoveries over the past, uh, gosh, five, even 10 years, uh, things have changed. As we launch new telescopes into space and build these great new observatories, uh, as, as they come online, they're going to completely shift our view of the universe again, or they're gonna shift our view of what types of planets can exist what those planets might look like, if they might be viable for life. And I think that there will be a lot of new, different subversions of science that are going to be birthed from this process. And to me, that's that's really exciting. There's so many uh, 
unknown unknowns at this point. So the commitment of folks to to really build these new instruments is, while, while knowing well, we're building it, we don't know what we're going to see, but we're going to build it anyway, is, is really exciting. Um, will W first be uh, engaging in any other um, science while it's, while it's in operation? Yes. So uh, W first has uh, a bunch of different modes that it works in. Uh, another part, uh, another very important thing that W first works on is a dark energy survey. Um, and don't ask me too much about that because that is very, very different. But I know that's going to be revolutionary for dark energy. And um, they also have a technology demonstration called a, a coronagraph. So they're going to fly the first ever coronagraph instrument in space, which is another way to detect exoplanets where you actually physically block the light from the star and take a picture of the planet as it is orbiting the star. So that will be the first space-based coronagraph, which is exciting. And in addition to that, one of the big things that was really important for W first was making sure that it was accessible to a lot of different sciences and a bunch of different scientists. So they have a dedicated It's called a guest observer program where uh, different scientists can propose, uh, say, I have this science question I want to have answered. And um, they can propose and say, "Okay, I want to use WFIRST for this. And WFIRST can then go on and do their science. So there's time allocated for that as well. Oh, that's really, really cool to hear. What are you most looking forward to in terms of the future of exoplanet research? So I'm really looking forward to seeing um, the, the first true solar system analog. So we found a bunch of extra solar systems, so group, uh, other stars that have many planets around them, but none of those systems look anything like ours. And W first with its capabilities is going to be able to find a true Mars analogs, true Saturn, Jupiter, and Neptune and Uranus analogs, potentially even getting down to the size of Ganymede, which would be really, really exciting uh, to find some exomoons. So I'm looking forward to seeing for real, just how common our type of solar system is in the galaxy, because that is something that we have no idea about. So that's going to take a little bit of time to uh, discover, and we have to wait for W first to launch, and then we need to wait for it to take its observations and then all of the analysis. But within the next 10 years or so, I think we might have a better handle on how common real solar systems are. So that's what I'm most excited about. Fantastic. Well, Savannah, thanks very much for speaking to me today. It's going to be really, really interesting um, seeing the science that comes out of this and and what you and your colleagues uh, come up with. Thank you so much for your time. It's been a pleasure speaking with you.